One second, chap. <coughs> Are we on? Anybody there? Oh no. <laughs> That better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well done, Fred. <laughs> I can see. I'm early. You're not supposed to be on yet. <laughs> While well, we're waiting for a few to uh, plug on, um, I've just been outside, 27 degrees it is in shade, so uh, it's a bit warm, <laughs> but uh, let's hope you can all uh, enjoy the afternoon, um, I'm injured look, can you see, <laughs> oh dear I've got trigger finger, <laughs> or trigger thumb rather. So uh, I had a look on the internet, and uh, now I see you in yours, Chris. Um, and had a look, and they said if you went to the doctor's, they'd probably put a plastic splint on it. So I've made my own, because <laughs> I'm not going to the doctor's at the minute. <laughs> and uh, it's still hurting, I'm afraid, but as long as it'll wrap around that pole when we start, uh, that's all that matters. <laughs> oh, well done, Vic. Hope you're alright my friend, good lad, and uh, let's hope we can uh, have a few laughs, And uh, but Clive wants me to do a bit more today on um, some of my better wins. <coughs> I Over the years I have been lucky enough to win some of the big matches, and uh, you know, which many people haven't, so I, uh, that's, I've got to stick my chest out a bit there. <laughs> We, uh, we've all, all the top lads have won some great matches, I know, but, uh, you know, in the old days, um, the John Smiths and the National and, you know, they, they weren't things like Match This and Preston uh, Festivals. Um, it was natural fishing and uh, they were the sort of, um, <laughs> Clive, how do you keep pigeons? I've told that one, Clive. <laughs> Um, and funnily enough, I don't know if you uh, have also watched, but I saw, uh, I watched one that Tommy did, Tommy Pickering did, uh, probably an old one from Angling Times, um, I watched that a couple of days ago, and I've got to be honest, some of the uh, comments he made, Tommy were a great angler, as you know, I mean, uh, he did very well on internationals, and uh, he won the world championship, so he, he's a good lad, Tommy is, and uh, we're quite good friends, me and Tom. And um, but some of the things that he spoke when he was talking about how he learnt fishing with uh, Dennis, etc., uh, and he w did make a, a jolt in my memory that uh, that's how things were in the old days. And uh, one of the main things that uh, I think that um, and some of them of you uh, will make note was in the old days uh, because there wasn't these uh, the competitions that there were on nowadays um, fishing you know for the for your country was the number one aim of many many of the top match anglers and um, you know and, and I've got to be honest I really wanted to fish for England when I was in my younger days um, I was an engineer uh, during an apprentice uh, which I think I covered again before but um, sorry, Tash is itching. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, yeah, as I got into open matches and started to win, you know, uh, and particularly I wanted to get on, you know, the bigger matches, which many in the old days you did have to be invited. Uh, I can remember the one called something Carpets, and for a few years Terry Thomas was it? Terry Thomas who used to be on television. He was a, a laugh. If any of you saw his uh, his. Uh, weekly or monthly uh, do on television 
But uh, he invited me to this carpet match and I didn't do any good but it was on a lake somewhere, bream fishing. Um, but uh, but it was, uh, you know, I wanted to fish for England but I got in uh, business. Uh, I'd got a good job with metal box, you know, and I, I'd got time to spend getting my tackle ready and everything. But I was so crazy on fishing I wanted to get, you know, live and die it if you wish. And... Um, I did manage to get a job as a rep, um, which slowly moved into being partnership. Um, but basically, my first best in business, it all went wrong. Um, we were soon in trouble, and uh, and then pressures on, and fishing became... My actual match wins became a back, back seat. It was survival that mattered. And we'll not go into all that, because uh, it was a tough, tough and torrid time for both me and John Dean. Um, and it's, look, people, many people say to me, why did John Dean pack up, you know, when he was so great at his time, when he was at his peak? And to be honest, uh, business was one of the things. John, John wasn't like me. Look, I could fish with a branch with a bit of <laughs> line attached. That's, I just love fishing. Uh, but John was a different, uh, John, unless he could do things absolutely bob on, he wanted to practice, have all his tackle ready and spot on and he'd go before a match at Burton Joyce, he'd go on the Thursday and have a practice so we got you know, we knew how the river were fishing. And that's one of the, the other reasons. Hey, Russ, how are you going on, buddy? <laughs> and um you know, I don't mean just because of the practice, but often he'd know what was happening and uh, John lived and died fishing. And once we got in business and things weren't working very well. John, uh, he was just concentrating on the business. He couldn't do fishing without being absolutely sorted. All his hooks died, everything, and his mind working. Whereas I just had to go fishing. <laughs> and funnily enough, some of my great wins actually were in the period of uh, when the business wasn't doing very well. Uh, God knows how I won them, but I did. <laughs> so uh, anyway, look, we'll start with... Um, that's a bit of an introduction we've got going. So uh, we'll talk about uh, one of, look, these are not in particular any, I'm not sort of picking one match out in front of another. I'm just going to talk about, uh, you know, a great win for me here and there. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you'll understand anyway. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about was in uh, 1977, <coughs> when I was a young chicken, how old would I be then? 48, 48, 68, 32. I'd be, is that right? Thir no, 29, 29. And um, it, the big Welland matches were on. And uh, open matches were perhaps just about being started now. And a little bit, we, we used to fish, um, look, before the open matches really come on, I mean, it were all club fishing. I've said before, association matches were the big matches. There'd still be 90 there. Uh, and all the clubs had come together, um, but the biggest match of the year would be into club when all the all the buses had come and all the clubs had compete against each other to get the winning club of the year. Um, but we also, while the club scene was on, as I say, we fished association matches once a month, um, but we also fished the Welland Championship, the Neem Championship, the Witham, um, the big Big matches, Relief Channel Championship, which were always oh, four, five, six hundred people fishing um, because there was, uh, I mean, we'd have club matches on the Welland, um, but at that time there wasn't opens, uh, there was just the Welland Championship, and then there'd be club matches here and there. And um, I was once sixth on the Welland Championship, but the one I'm going to talk about is um, the likely lads were running open matches on the River Welland <clears throat> and this is a period when the National was going to be on the Welland I don't know if this particular match was before the National or after but there was 600 fishing now that's a lot of guys it's virtually like a National isn't it um, and um, so off we went and uh, I don't know I spoke about Roy Dibble we used to go in a van uh, with Roy Dibble, Roger Holmes, um, Paul Chapman uh, some of you lads won't know these, but some of them will. Keith Dawes, um, 
who, who some of them, I mean, look, we've been to Stafford Moor and all that sort of thing. So some of them will, you'll recognise some of those names. But we used to go every week in his in Dibs van. And off we went to Welland. And uh, we drew, and then, of course, on the Welland, the road runs all the way up the match stretch. And they drop each one of us off. And as I remember, I've jotted down here, we're on peg 225, but that's only a bit of a guess, to be fair. But uh, I remember him dropping me off, and I think he'd be somewhere around the Red Barn, or Green Barn, as it used to be called. Uh, anybody who used to fish the old Welland matches will know where that area is. And uh, you just climb over this great big gate, drops off. I mean, it was a wicker basket job. You'd only have a wicker basket, an old all. And a carry all with your ground bait and bits and bobs in. And uh, so you climb over the fence. Now, again, any of you lot who used to go to the Welland will know there used to be a whack, a whacking grit horse, uh, a cart horse, and there used to be two of them. And these cart horses knew that as you go over that fence, ground bait, lovely dinner for them. <laughs> and they were massive. Look, they tower above you. You know, six foot. You, I mean, I'm six foot two. There'd be another foot and a half above me, and they were they were frightening, to be honest with you. Great big clunking things, and you're trying to fear them off. Go on, you bugger, hit them with bag on those. <laughs> and if you're lucky, they run off. But a few times, many people lost the crampate going across this field, and because uh, you've got a, a way to walk up, up to, uh, and there used to be a bank on the well, and some of you won't know because there's never no matches there now. But River Welland were great fishing. I used to love Rio Island. But of course, when you're on a 600 pegger, bring more with it. Uh, there used to be loads of big roach and all sorts in the Welland, but uh, the winners will get bream. So eventually I go over this fence and feared off these horses and uh, walked along way up over the bank. And I, and I walked down the bank, I remember looking across the river and the river was clear. It was a nice day. And uh, as I walked down towards my peg, I think I had to walk sort of 20 pegs down from the barn so some of you lot might know what numbers they were but I think they're in 200s 250 something like that but um, walked down the bank and you kept looking at the wall thinking right oh, that looks a nice peg you know blah 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 because there's always been on the well end there's always been um, weeds for sort of two rods out one of the battles was if you caught a bream you still got to get down with weed I mean, look, we hadn't got poles, so we could keep them on top. It were all waggler or bomb. Or, well, they weren't even feeders in them days. It was just bomb. Um, swing tip. <laughs> no quiver tips had come out at that time. And uh, although it went far behind, a few, you know, within the next two years, the quiver tip came out. But everybody was swing tipping. And um, so anyway, I'm walking down to mid-peg. And then all of a sudden, I thought, oh, it's a bit of colour here. There's a bit of colour, isn't it? Went a few more paths, oh blimey, it's getting coloured. <laughs> so, uh, as you gathered, I'm in the right area. And uh, basically, there was about 20 pegs where the colour was, there was obviously a lot of bream or whatever in the area. And uh, so I gets to my peg and gets my wicker basket. And there used to be a bit of a, as I remember, sandy. And if there were some weeds, you have to. <laughs> Try and sort your own way out. Uh, I can't remember how, what we used to do. I don't remember them in drags or anything, but uh, you'd try and pick a bit of a slot so you thought you got a chance again, you'd fish over the weed. Because uh, often it was two two rods plus out. But anyway, we start, I mixed some ground bait. You're only, I think I was onto brown crumb by now. Um, if you heard my earlier blogs, I used to have to use biscuit because I went and didn't have enough money to buy brown crumb but I'd be winning an odd bob so I'd got enough money to buy brown crumb now so I guess me a big brag of brown crumb out and we didn't use have any additives um, a bit of white we'd have brown crumb white crumb and you'd mix enough brown white crumb into the brown crumb to make it stiff enough and look there were no feeders it was basically mixing mix up chuck some maggots in which were alive we'd use squats if you can get some squats um, so I imagine I probably would have bought. Uh, my intention was to fish bread, so I probably might not have put anything in except my crumb. So the old whistle would go. I mean, we set swing tip up. I probably set a waggler up as well, in case I had to fish for roach, because they didn't always show, of course. Bream. But when you're on a match that size, look, many times we'd just fish the match. You'd, have, you'd perhaps have some, you'd have some maggots, you'd have some worms, and to get worms, there were no 
going off to the tackle shop and having quarter a kilo, you had to dig them. <laughs> there was no other way. Um, if you want lobbies, that is. Luckily, my dad, I think I mentioned before, my dad was a keen gardener and he's got a, you know, a muck heap, if you like, and I've delved in there and got a few red ones, red worms. It weren't thick, but there were some in. And so I'd have a pot of worms. Anyway, the match, the whistle went, I was set up with my swing tip with a bomb and a up length, you know, two foot, which is a normal bream fishing. Um, and, but I'd have a good hook on, you know, a 12 or something like that, because I'm bread fishing. Um, we used to go, a group of us, uh, used to always go on the River Welland for a week. Uh, sorry, not Welland, uh, Relief Channel for a week. And, uh, and that was mainly bread fishing. So we'd done quite a lot of bread fishing. Look, in the old days, we did some bream fishing. Uh, you know, nowadays, you fish for bream, but listen, we fished them for years. Every match at Welland, bream fishing. That's all we did. And sometimes you fish all day and never have a pull. Um, but, you know, all the day, there are a lot of bream in the river. Some days you'd catch three or four and win, just perhaps scrape your section. But if you're on them, you'd be looking to catch £30 plus, as I remember, £25, £30. Not very often it was 40 but, uh, you know, you needed a big 20 to get in. Anyway, this particular day, you know, I was a big lad, look, I was six foot, whoosh, I could chuck a ball of ground eight, two thirds to three quarters over the Welland, depending where you drew, because it was wide in places. Anyway, in goes six balls or so. Push, push, push. On goes a piece of bread. Whop. And as I remember, no bites for oh, an hour and a half. And somebody, two or three up, I seen him go a bring. And they don't try and look worms, you know. But you see, with a big oak, you can put three or four worms on. Or, of course, red worms. A bunch of worms, that, that used to work. An octopus, as I used to call it. Oh, six worms in head, so it was like that. You know, and you'd sit there, and when they took it, boom, <laughs> rodding. <laughs> but anyway, this day, it were all on bread. I was fishing bread. And uh, anyway, after about an hour and a quarter, I had a few flickers, and, and then up it goes. Now, if you've ever done it, you want to do not many here, a lot of done much swing tipping. But here, here you are, the old pencil. We'll go back to the pencil. If this is swing tip, you know, look. Uh, the bream bites would be like this. So they're not much sim different than what the quiver tips bite, but when you're fishing bread, you'd wait till it went like that and held up like that. <laughs> That's odd. <laughs> also, we're bread fishing. Look, it's a big bait. And if, if, you, if it was like this, usually if you were tempted to strike it, there'd be nothing there. So the way to fish it, and Ivan used to show, Ivan told me, I mean, I used to fish with Lester A. And, I, and he told me how to... Keep your hands, sit on your bloody hands, it's uh, <laughs> and uh, up we go. Anyway, after about an hour, I had one of them <laughs> clock and the proper bream up well and out up to six pound, some even bigger. But uh, as I remember, I had look, it was to be honest, this match, although it's interesting, I won the match um, and I won a few quid. I, in fact, somewhere in my book, I think I won 350 odd quid. Um, which look in 1977 that were a lot of dosh you know that were a good win and uh, that well really I paid for all my matches all year near enough but uh, I had a, some I had an odd skimmer a pound and a half but generally with a sort of four, to four pound fish and I weighed 28 pound and uh, this was the hot spot I, I was in the middle of this hot spot and there were another 22 and a 24 but I won it reasonably easy you know what I mean and, uh, a great day a great day <laughs> a big in them days look I went very old to win a match that size uh, you know it, look I remember it now it was a great win uh, but really not much more to say other than that and so that's one out of the way and uh, the horses had buggered off when we went back so I didn't have any trouble with that <laughs> and off we went home so We'll talk about another one. Look, I, you all probably know I've won the John Smiths a few times or twice and I've won the actual final four times because um, I've won Smiths twice, I've won the Witch Haven and I've won the individual team match. Um, but I'm going to talk now about uh, the Scottish National. Now, a lot of you not wouldn't even know what the Scottish National is. They only fished it for, I think, three years. But... 
Uh, it, it was in my early days when I, uh, Trentman were on. I was fishing Burton Joy, so it was, uh, you know, in that period when I'd won my first couple of matches and I'd, I'd been fishing with Trentman for a couple of years. And uh, the Scottish National came up in the close season because in Scotland there were no close season, just same as they went in Lincolnshire, in our area. He could fish lakes in uh, Lincolnshire. So um, we're uh, going to, well, sorry, not Fed or, or Trentman said, some of the lads says, shall we go and have a go? So uh, Pete Palmer, Roy Tolson, I think it was, set up a bus and... Uh, can somebody just send me a message? You can all hear me, can't you? Just so that uh, I know you're, uh, we haven't lost you or anything. Because um, that does happen. The uh, Somebody just send me a quick wave or something. Because um, I haven't seen a message since Les Asby. Les Ashby, come on. Um, yes, I can see there's somebody. Right, that's all right then. We're still on. And um, so, um, that's it. Thank you. So, um, Roy Dawson and uh, Pete Palmer says, well, see, well, let's see if we can get a bus up, see if we can go. Well, 30 odd, uh, we soon fill 30, they soon fill 30. Aye, that's all right, Clive, we're on. Yep, cook it. <laughs> and, uh, and, of course, later on, you can ask any questions, and if uh, I miss your question, by all means, ask again, because you go and come up while I'm busy talking, and they sometimes get forgotten. So, anyway, we're going on Scottish National. And um, they raised a bus, which uh, my, I don't know, my wife, or I don't know, I was married there, I think I was, I probably perhaps been married then. But anyway, they had the bus, it was at um, Nottingham University, we, we met that, and I got on the bus, and off we went. Now, for a start, if you any of you lads who went on the buses in the old days, it was only just the same bloody boots full of baskets, wicker baskets, and it's all the way down the middle of the bus, Maggots <laughs> everywhere, not to some extent. Um, but we're on the bus, are we on the way to Scotland? Nah, you don't realise how far Scotland is. It's a long way, <laughs> it is a long way to Scotland. Uh, I didn't realise how long. And of course, well, I suppose we went up the M6, and if M6 were there then, I don't know if it was or not. <laughs> we are a long way to Scotland. And the good news was, was and we're all talking fishing, so of course... You know, the hours stroll by as we're on this way. But as I remember, it took us four hours, five hours. I can't remember exactly how long, but I know it was a long, long trip. But the good news was, when we got there, we hadn't got an hotel or anything. We had to sleep in the bus. <laughs> now, if any of you lot have sat on the bloody bus, <laughs> try to go to sleep, you'll know you said, there's that shape, oink, oink. <laughs> there's no, no... Peeling it back like I am nowadays so you can have a rest. Oh, God, what a nightmare. All right, Bruce, lad. Adrian, <laughs> Jeff. And, um, oh, we were absolutely knackered with bloody drive oh, <laughs> up the motorway. We did stop somewhere and have a drink, of course. But when we got there, as I remember, we, we just pulled in. We pulled in a lay-by somewhere in a field or <laughs> whatever. We went in a hotel or anywhere to get anything. So it were a flask or whatever. And... And then through, no, we're still talking and your headache starts aching after talking for hours. And uh, you'll probably have it listening to me for hours. <laughs> but anyway, um, then you try and get to sleep and, oh, God, your knees are aching because you can't straighten them. And you keep trying to be the rest. As I remember, luckily, I ended up lying down in the middle on top of baskets. <laughs> so I did get a bit of rest. But, the time morning come around, God dear, it, we weren't exactly full of spring roses. They must be joking, we were tired out. But anyway, we, we drove to match and there was, I mean, a lot there. There were, I don't know, three, four hundred there at least. I mean, it were, uh, it were first time it had been on, as, as I remember. I don't think it had been on before. And it's on the Forth and Clyde Canal. Well, at this time, I'd never fished a canal. Never ever, but we went on rivers, uh, but it was somewhere to go. So, uh, not really knowing what to expect. I've not been on one, but, you know, I chatted on the way up, see what uh, they thought, and we thought it. There were no poles, so it'd be waggler. And, but I thought, I'm going to set a stick up, because there's a bit of a toe. Even a slow one, you can still, you know, 
hold tight to your float and a uh, bit better presentation if you get a bow. But anyway, I drew. <coughs> Ain't got a clue where I drew. <laughs> uh, so we walked down the banking, and uh, as I remember, Rolf here, I drew uh, near Johnny Rolf. And because, you know, there were quite a few people there. Uh, I can't remember exactly, but I know Rolf who were there, and Tolson and Palmer. A few of the other lads who were in Knott's Fed, um, you know, and Knott's Anglers, Nottingham lads came along. I can't get a run there. But I know, as we drew, I'm drawn somewhere near Rolfie. So uh, we got tottering off this bank upside at Canal and somebody told us where to drop us off, like the bus dropped us off. And uh, as we're walking up, this Kevin, Ashurst, big Kev. And now, of course, it, we... I mean, okay, he's still perhaps don't know Scottish Nash, uh, Fourth and Clyde Canal. I don't know if he does or not, but he obviously would have been in canal fishing. There are lots of canal fishing around Manchester, and uh, bit sound of it. When we got to him, he knew Rolfie well. He knew me by sight because he used to come to Welbeck Lakes. And uh, where's that drawn in his broad Lancashire? I can't do it <laughs> very well, but he gave us a bit of uh, to Rolfie, like and Rolfie get him and the yeah, not doing so well there. Where are you drawn, lad? God, I don't suppose you could remember my name. Um, so I told him, like, and he says, oh, you might do all right there, you're in the area, like, you know. So off we go, and basket down, and I sat down. As I remember, it was about 16, 18, 17 metres wide. Not much more, it went to uh, ever so wide. Um, so I let the wagger up, and a stick float, like I told you. Sat down. Whistle goes. A few casters, only got casters and maggots. I might have had some pinkies, but that would be it. So I fed casters on far bank. Of course, we dreamt that like catching quality fish, so we didn't fiddle about pinkies and such very often. <laughs> so started feeding casters on far bank, and Intel went with Waggler, and uh, they were about three foot deep, not much more. Uh, I suppose for a canal, that's quite deep, isn't it? So, uh, But that's how I remember it, were about three foot. And... Um, no weeds on far bank, it was a stone wall on the far bank. So anyway, fish for ten minutes and we go a bite and that gets a nice roach. Five ounce or so, six ounce. And uh, the first hour, I caught a few four or five ounce roach. We won about 12, 14 ounce of proper roach. I thought, well, that's a nice, you know, but, but it was slow. So uh, I thought I'll try and stick. So I started feeding maggots down middle. And I went on my stick. Phew, it were absolutely solid, <laughs> but the fish weren't so big. These were two ounce, three ounce fish, but it were a fish every chunk. <laughs> bagging, bagging, and I was like that for, oh, getting on for an hour and a half, two hours. So halfway through match, I'm well into double figures and um, doing all right. So at that, it sort of clicked. I thought, I had that big fish on casting off. Stop putting a few casters in. So I, I, had a, I pushed I'll put a few casters in that middle as well as still feeding a few maggots. And I thought, well, just just for a bit, I'll try Waggler again. And I went up Waggler and I had a couple of fish, but no especially, it was better than I had tried. So back on stick. And then I put a caster on. <laughs> wow. <laughs> just one of them, uh, one of them things you do on the day. In went the caster. Just mended it, you know, kept a nice tight like it settles like down it goes clonk. Twelve ounce roach. Next chuck, clonk, pound roach, and I had eight roach in eight chucks. All great big stonkers like this. <laughs> and the match is going on and uh, although I, don't get me wrong, I had to wait till they were off caster, they were slower, you know, it weren't instant or anything like that. But when you got one, they were four times bigger than them up maggot. And uh Basically, look, nothing went wrong. It, went, it was a good match. I caught well all day. And when scales come, I thought, well, I've had a great day. <laughs> you know, good days fishing. Scales come down and what's top? And uh, a, a guy called John Smiles from Middlesbrough. I'd heard that later on he died, but uh, talking to Colin Mitchell uh, last year, he said he's still around. Now, I don't know uh, whether anyone up that area knows of him, but uh, I remember it was John Smiles, and uh, he weighed £22.4, I think he weighed, and they come down to me, and I thought, phew, that's a big weight, <laughs> I've got a good weight, but anyway, I weighs in £21.12, so I actually came second, but I won a cup, nine foot high, 
<laughs> not kidding, it was massive, this great big cup. And as I remember, there were only me on the bus one anything. <laughs> Which were good. All these Trentman and good old Colin in his younger days. <laughs> Won this great big trophy. And uh, and a few quid, I don't know, two, three hundred quid or something. Um, but that were a great win. Now, the following year, obviously, I had to take my cup back. They didn't, they didn't go on the bus, so I do believe me and Dave Thomas went. And we stopped in a hotel with Sheena and uh, Avis. Um, and uh, they only ran it, I think, I don't know, they had some weed trouble or something. And for some unknown reason, the Scottish National only lasted two, or at most three years, to my knowledge. Um, perhaps, I don't know if anyone else, um, Gordon points it's Scottish Open. Well, it was called the Scottish National. That's right, it was called the Scottish National, definitely. And um, the following we went, year it went, and it fished rubbish. Um, I did win my section, um, and I caught some on caster again, but I remember my peg were very, very weedy. I'd only got a little channel down the middle, but I caught on my waggler, um, and an odd fish on my stick as well. But it was one below every weight, came below a, a lock. So, of course, where any boats had come through, it had cleared the weed a little bit, and all the fish seemed to be around there. And I think after another one or two years, it decided it weren't worth running, so it never happened again. Um, but, you know, I had my good day, and I won a big trophy, and, and I remember it. The first canal, not many of you, a lot of fishy first canal, and I had 21 pound. <laughs> so, where do we go from there, then? We'll talk about John Smith's, because end of day. They are great matches. I mean, look, they were the highlight of my career when uh, I won my first one. And uh, I won my first one in 1984. It was called uh, the Courage Colt 45. And uh, just to put us in the... Um, I'd never fished the Avon. We were Trent lads. That's where we mainly fished. Well, I fished on an odd other river, obviously. But 90% uh, of my matches were on... The Fens and the Trent. The running water was near enough. Up, the Borough Wash, of course, that had started coming and that was solid. But um, this particular uh, year, um, the National was on the Bristol Avon. And uh, I know I mentioned Dave Thomas a few times, but we were quite friendly, me and Dave. He used to come and stop at my house and when we were going on Trent sometimes and he stopped weekend and then fish a couple of Trent matches or wherever we were going. And... Uh, we got on well, Sheena got on well with Avis, and of course then when we went fishing, they'd got somewhere else to go, wherever they went. And um, I don't remember Avis fishing the matches, because our Sheena, she did fish when she were younger, when we were caught in. She went to Ireland once with girls from Chesterfield. But anyway, I'm dragging off. The point is, the, the National, uh, as I say, was on Bristol Avon. And uh, so, me and David, uh, we decided to go on holiday. It was somewhere nice, Bristol, and um, so we went to. Uh, we stopped in Bristol, or unless we anyway somewhere around there somewhere. But we, uh, funny enough, got talking to I can't remember Tom. Look, some I don't know. Is any of you lot from down Bristol way? But he's an old lad. He over here. I don't know if he's alive now. But Tom was a good match angler around Bristol. Uh, an old guy, I uh, can't remember his second name, I'm sorry. Perhaps if we could, uh, anybody can come up with that. But Tom took us nearly every day uh, on a different section on the Bristol Avon. And I know we're going off of... Uh, <laughs> I like that. Uh, well done, Ian. And, um, but... Uh, I know we're going off of the point, but the thing being is we had all, we fished eight sections, ten sections, over the fortnight of Tom Coulson. Well done, Vic. Yes, good lad, Tom Coulson. That was the old lad. He was a good old lad, Tom. We're nice bloke. And he took us every day to a different section. And um, we thought we'd got Bristol Avon pretty well sorted. And I've got another little story there that I, I might come back to that in a minute because we're going to talk about John Smith. Anyway, as we're coming back, uh, or on the Thursday or the Friday, I think I think it was on the Thursday night, Dave said, there's a new competition this Saturday. 
on um, on Avon. It's Courage, Colt 45. Do you fancy going? And I said, there's a qualifier. You've got qualified. There's last qualifier this week. So uh, I said, I know, I'm in for that. Yeah. So he says, shall we go home tomorrow? And then we can go on Avon all the way back and have a bit of a practice at Evesham. So I said, yeah, yeah, that's fine. All right, we'll do that then. So ladies were quite happy. They could have a day walking around Evesham. So uh, I'd never seen Evesham, never seen Avon. So uh, we pulled up on Crown Meadow after, you know, a few hours. It's about lunchtime. It might have been two o'clock. I don't know. I can't remember, but because uh, we got pack up and all that. So... Uh, we said we'll have. I know we we go into Crown Meadow, and uh, we've plonked down just above the bridge, the road, main road bridge. So um, I think I'd be about five above the bridge, just as a figure. Which in the old days we found that was a reasonable road area. It's not so good now. I don't know why, but the roads seem to have, you know, not, it's not very often that area chucks a good weight. But then again, even uh, nowadays. You don't always get roach feeding anyway. But anyway, that's our point. But uh, so we sat down and uh, go on, then we'll see. We'll have a little match, like, you know. And uh, so I set a stick float up and chucked some maggots in and we started. And I'd never really, there weren't many days in, in Trent then, but there were days and uh, I was catching a few and oh, missing a few bites, as I remember. And, uh, but, you know, we had a look. Went up Wagler and chucked some maggots in the middle, it erupted. I thought, bloody hell, what's going off here like? And, uh, which never happened on Trent, you never saw that. And uh, so I had to go up Wagner for a bit and caught a few, but we didn't fish for long, so we caught a few days and a few nice roach. And I think Dave had a chublet, and Dave probably caught a few more than me because he used to fish for Dave's regular up wharf and things like that in, in uh, Yorkshire. So off we went home and so we, he stopped at our house again, went and bought some fresh bait and got some new casters and all that lot of maggots. So I thought, I'm going to ring Ivan, because uh, I, I think I was fishing with Leicester AS then. So I rung Ivan, and I knew that, uh, I mean, even there were matches at Eversham, and I'd, I'd seen that three weeks before Ivan had got money. He'd come third with £20 or something, so good weight lot. So I rang, and I might have covered a bit of this, uh, I'm not sure. But anyway... Yeah, you know, I'm sure you'll be all right. <laughs> Listen to it. So Ivan says to me, he says, well, everybody else will lose feed. But he said, I used ground bait and the fish aren't put off with ground bait. And you'll keep them on bottom. Um, so I didn't particularly fish up in water like traditionally we used to. You know, once we got used to the water, the, what you fishing were like. But uh, I set a waggler up and it was mainly waggler fishing. Anyway, I drew two below the culvert, below the bridge. Um, which is not particularly a great area to be in nowadays, it's full of snags. <laughs> but uh, of course the boats were opposite there, but there were a lot of fishing river in them days. A river, I started, and I remember I mixed a load of ground bait, I put, he said, put loads of hemp in, put casters in, two, three pint. So, so I took four pint of hemp, three pint of casters, and half a gallon, three quarters of a gallon of maggot. So I took a load of bait. And, uh, but he says, take some worms. He says, now and again, put a worm on. And I think I perhaps mentioned this, and he says, if it goes under, it'd be a proper chub. You'll catch chublets, roach, and you might catch them better on maggots, of course. But he said, if it goes under on worm, you'll catch chub. So, uh, anyway, mixed me ground bait. In goes two, three pints of hemp, mixed it all up. Well drawn, well done, Steve. <laughs> and... Uh, Puts two pint of casters in ground bait and uh, whistle goes. So I start off waggling. Ball of ground bait, loose fed. Ball of ground bait, loose fed. And I win match. I had 18 pound odd, uh, mainly chublets, sort of, you know, two ounce, three ounce, four ounce, six ounce, odd six ounce. But every time I put a worm on, if I got a bite, it, I would my bob on, it'd be pounding off, two pound. And uh, I win match. So, poof, qualified, no problem. Dave, now he drew very difficult, he drew middle at deeps and fished brilliantly to catch 16 pounder. I don't particularly know how he caught, I think he caught on stick float. Um, but look, that were a brilliant weight in middle at deeps. In old days, 
Unless you've got no Evesham a bit more, you, you caught nothing in middle of deeps half the time. But uh, Dave did very well, so he qualified. So we both qualified, and we're off to Eversham the following week on the final. And uh, they'd be set, it was sold out. I mean, all the qualifiers, they'd all qualified. I don't know why we didn't hear anything about it beforehand, but uh, there'd be 70 fishing. I think there were 70 fishing in them days. And um, anyway, you know, I don't remember it. They weren't all the uh, like there has been for many years, you know, the tackle stalls and all that sort of thing. This was a new competition, and uh, I don't remember there being all the stalls, but we drew somewhere, I presume, on Crown Meadow, and uh, I drew one above the bridge, on he trotting down underneath the bridge. Now, I fancied that, of course I did, because it was got some cover under bridge and um, it's a long peg because the black neck floats well you know it's other side bridge and it's a wide bridge so you've got sort of and look at Eversham in them days in fact I've shown on Facebook um, my peg because I saved the I saved the peg number I haven't brought it actually I was sort of showed it um, it's downstairs but anyway and it said number 36 on it now the peg now is only 20, I believe, or 21. Um, so they, when the floods were on, some 2008, they re-pegged all Eversham and get everybody more room. The, the pegs were that close, you'd only got eight, not eight yards on some pegs. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> but Eversham now, you've all got 12 yards or more. Um, and often 14, 15 yards. So, but... This particular day, I was happy because I got a long peg. And uh, so the match goes, you know, I set stick float up, a feeder up. Feeders were in then, obviously. Uh, I might get feeder, we're fishing Trent regular, we might get feeders. Andrew Morrison arrives. <laughs> and, um, and a waggler. Now, I've learnt already now that the fish come shallow when you start fishing waggler. Uh, at Evesham, often, or in the old days, used to feed, it used, the water used to erupt, you can you don't see it very often nowadays, so you know, younger lads won't have known, but as the first catapult, psh, days, days and bleak, and, and you'd perhaps catch an odd chub and roach, only you'd fish three foot deep, two foot six, three foot deep, a three BB waggler, and I used to find, um, what's the name at floats, um, who used to make them, from Coventry, um, Oh, it's gone, brain's gone. <laughs> but a little insert waggler, not big, two B big, and two number eights down the line. Now, you might think tens, but eights were more positive. And where's the eight? You saw your float, it was an insert waggler, so as your eight settled, you know, you could see the actual shot settling. And if it didn't settle, there'd be a dates on, or a bleak on, and if you're lucky, a chub on. And an odd, odd roach. But this particular day, I'd sat down, it was deep, on my stick float, uh, it was oh, eight, eight, nine foot as I remember. And um, so I just fancied it was a nice flow, it was a nice flow under this bridge. So I fancied the stick first. So I, for some reason, and usually I'm always, in the old days I used to start on wag, but uh, I fancied the stick. So I started feeding. You used to need a good angler above you and caught off his bait. Yeah, and that's dead on, uh, Steve. You're dead right, because they were dead short, the pegs were, and so he chucked in, ended up in yours if you, if the fish didn't eat them. But anyway, I started on stick float, and um, I've uh, ruptured my finger. I've got click finger, uh, Andrew. And I looked on the internet, so I've uh, put uh, just a plastic support so I don't bend it. That's all. It can't drop off. <laughs> anyway, uh, back to the story. So I went on stick and started loose feeding maggots, and uh, I started catching gudgeon, little roach, um, you know, an odd roach, perch, and I sort of had an hour and a half a steady, pretty efficient net, rough, you know, uh, not bagging, days, but catching, you know, I was catching, and every now and again I pick catty up and feed it middle, and. Um, Stan Bennett, what's that supposed to mean, right? Anyway, I'd be feeding it, I fed it middle with my catty, looking at Waggler. Anyway, after an hour and a half, I thought, well, I've got three or four pound, or two pound, I don't know, but I've been catching, and, you know, steady, putting some of it in net regular. They were quite a lot of grudging, if I remember, but uh, 
Anyway, I thought I'll have a go at wags, so big swag up like go it at me three foot depth, which I normally fish. Um, but it's very wide just there, uh, it always has been, the, the river widens because of the bridge and um, I did fish me normal little tiny waggers I remember I had to put something a bit big because I've been feeding two thirds over but anyway, off it goes my waggler, double maggot, feeds in and fed, chucks it in fed and it tops down like, first run through, goes under, I thought, did you I missed that, come back, no hook Oh God! <laughs> Disaster <laughs> broke on first. Oh Christ, that's a jump. Bloody hell. So, anyway, dies another hook on like, you know, fed again. Look, it all out. We all do it. Don't tell me. Don't look at me. <laughs> Disgusted. <laughs> so, anyway, casting again. Next jump down, clunk. Jump two pound. Ooh, there we go. A dace. A yeah, couple more chump. Anyway, I asked. Oh, five or six chub um, in a golden spell for about half an hour. Um, and these were pounding off to two and a half, so I was soon knocking up to nearly ten pound. And um, <coughs> at which case they suddenly disappeared, or I, you know, I started catching days and bleak and bits and bobs, but the chub had wilted off, they'd gone. So I'll have another go on stick, so I. I thought I'll rest it, keep feeding it. So I come back on stick, went in stick, second run down, I get some bream two pound. <laughs> and I've never caught an oh I have, tell a lie, but in them days catching bream were very, very unusual. You didn't see many bream, but I had this bream. I thought, oh, that's a nice bonus as well. And uh, then I started catching a few more small fish and, and then that died like so back up waggler and but it wasn't the same, I had a few small fish and what can I do? You know, back on stick, a few little fish, but not very good. I tried feeder. I'll try there's obviously some chub here, so I put feeder on, chucked it in, plump, set, foss chuck in, <laughs> big chub, two and a half pound. Chucked in, never had another fish on it. But first chuck in, I got this two and a half pound. Anyway, you know, really, nothing went wrong, Ed, other than breaking on that first waggler fish. And I weighed £15, and I won it quite easily, actually. I think uh, £8 or something was second. So on the day, it was a flyer. <laughs> it were a good peg. I won me uh, tankard and me, you know, me trophy. And uh, in fact, that one there. <laughs> I thought I'd just put it inside. Uh, and I won a big trophy as well that I had to give back, of course. But uh, that's me, Courage Colt 45 trophy. And uh, I remember after the draw, of course, we all used to get together and like you do after matches. I mean, they, they did the presentation and mayor's there and you go on stage and all that night. And, uh, so it's a great time. There's not that many people. Look, end of the day, it's been going a long time, the, the, you know, it's 20 to 30 people won the uh, John Smiths and uh, I've been lucky enough to win it twice, so there's, uh, and there's only three of us done that. But that's my first win, but after the match, just to add uh, <laughs> Clive Smith, I, I used to know Clive and uh, he asked me to fish for his Winter League team. Um, because uh, he used to go to Eversham and we used to talk Kenneth Giles and etc. Um, but Clive, Colin, how, you going, how did he do that like? You know, he, he wanted to know how I'd caught him like. And uh, I said, well, you know, uh, do I get, do I tell him, do I tell him? <laughs> like we do, because there's another match tomorrow. <laughs> and, uh, but actually it might have, it might have been next day actually. I'm, I'm perhaps getting that wrong. I might have, after the match we'd had a chit chat and, uh, it might have been next morning when we'd drawn again uh, and Clive had drawn the peg above the bridge and I think he came to me because as I say I did know him and uh, to talk to like Colin how did you go online I can't remember where I drew the next day but uh, I said well Clive I, I caught on Wagler you know I explained I gave him a quick run down on my match and uh, Clive uh, he got his young lad with him uh, his young lad had only be Oh, five, six, seven, no more. Holding his hand like while he's chattering away, like, you know. Anyway, Clive went on and he won it with 20 odd pound. Um, or 20 or something like that, a good weight. 
a bit bigger than mine, four or five pound more than mine. So I did match like it. We didn't, I didn't catch anything particularly. Went to Clive. Hey, old Clive, how you going on, mate? He says, I've had 20. I says, I think I've won it like that. And uh, I said, well, well done, mate. Well done, like, you know, buddy. And his little lad's there, like, and uh, his little lad's only, and he said, my dad's had 20 pound. He's better than you. <laughs> I, can't, I can remember this t to this day. Uh, I thought, you little brat. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, Clive laughed like, you know, and we had a good laugh and <laughs> I'd put him right and it worked better for him than it did for me And the end of the day. But it was a flyer on that day, on that weekend, you know, the one above the bridge was, was the peg to be on. And, uh, and then I don't think it was one on the bridge again for, goodness me, years, years and years. I, can, I don't think the final's ever been uh, uh, won, if I remember. <laughs> oh, you watched it from the bridge. Well done, Clive. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that were a great win anyway. And uh, and if you like, while we're on it, might as well talk about my second win as well, because we'll talk it. I mean, again, they're both great wins. By now, I won my second one in 1993, so the match has been going on, you know, for 10 years now or more. In fact... My first, the, the winning on the Colt 45 was actually the second win because Tom Manning, uh, Tom, uh, Tom, oh God, I've spoke to him this morning. Tom, Tom, I forgot his name already. Yeah, Tom Manning, is it? Yeah, it's Tom Manning. He'd won it the first year. Um, we're, and I don't know where and what with, but uh, how, that was the second time it had been wrong that Tom won it the first year. And Tom's a great river angler. He still catches plenty of fish now. He fished for us last year in Winter League and won his section. <laughs> That's at Barford. And he's not fished it for years, but he still won it. Um, but anyway, my second win. So we're up, we're up to 1993. Now, during this meantime, between these sort of eight or nine years in between, the John Smith has really grown in uh, popularity. Um, and uh, courage have dropped out and uh, it's took on as I say by John Smith now um, the pub at that time How was it? Uh, I tend to think there, there were two or three people took over over the years but anyway it's John Smith now definitely and uh, now of course all the uh, tackle displays and all that sort of thing and again look it's still running now as you know the John Smith but in these days what we're talking now it was one of, well, it was the biggest, or the Nationals' biggest event of the year. And look, you used to come down to Crown Med, you couldn't get a car on it. it the one and the two um, car parks, you know, where the Crown Med and the tackle displays are, and the one below the bridge, absolutely solid. There would be 10, 15,000 people there. And when you were fishing, if you walked a big fish, mate, whoosh, you've got 50 anglers behind you watching. <laughs> it was a real, real match to be on. They, they, you know, it was at its peak now. And Dick Darrington was running, and to get even into the final was, a, you know, an art. And, uh, OK, I probably had had an invite with winning it before. Um, but I always did used to say, if you don't come on the qualifiers, you're not get picked. Now... So I always used to fish two or three qualifiers, and if I didn't qualify, which I did several times, besides me wins, um, I had an invite. Look, we were, you know, they used to invite half the field, and you, the other half would be qualifiers. And um, that's correct, Clive. Dick would be running it. So uh, anyway, anyone who's come on the old matches, they'd say, uh, we're fishing... Uh, I can't remember the time. Did we fish 11 till 4? I think we fished 11 till 4, if I remember. Five, still 5 hours. But we'd draw at 9. Right? 9 o'clock prompt, you'd say. And, uh, you know, we'll have a chew, chit chat, and then off to your draw. So you've got plenty of time. But what would happen is Dick would get going up microphone, and by the time he'd got everything set up, he'd perhaps be 5, 10 minutes late, and, and then he'd chit chat to up folks saying, Welcome. TV show and all this sort of thing so by the time you got and then of course he's got to draw 80 folks and there'd be 80 on match now um, so if you weren't lucky enough Tommy Pickering always used Tommy had always be first in bag that was what he wanted so the all in bag if he drew 
if there's a flyer there, it's in bag. And if you don't draw it, well, you don't draw it. But that's how it used to be. Uh, Tommy was always at the beginning. But, of course, Colin being Colin. Hi, Barry. You all right, buddy? Um, I was always about last. Because <laughs> anybody who knows me, I'm last at tackling up. I'm last at packing up. I always have been. And I probably still always will be. I set more up than most people. I, I'm, on, I'm a kitchen sink man, I like to have everything set, unless I've got it dead right in my head, what's going to happen, um, I always set to watch up, I often don't use them, but they're there if I want them, and, um, but Dick, had, all I was trying to say, over the two or three years previous to this match, Dick's still bloody talking at 25 past nine, and then we've got to draw, you know, if you're back end at queue, you don't get your ticket till 20 to 10, and then you've got to get to your drive down to Uxley's perhaps and get to your peg and you end up scrambling about last three quarters of an hour to get you can't get you don't get ready. And uh, I've just explained I like setting everything up, wherever it be. And um poles are in the game now. Look, in the old first matches there were no poles. And Dick Darrington I like a lot of people don't get Dick Darrington his credit in that Dick brought pole fishing on in England. Um more than any man I know. And why I say that is because out, out of the blue, this is about four years previous to this, out of the blue, he said, you've got to fish half the match on a pole and half the match on your normal method. Now, the first time he ever run it, I was um, on about peg seven, I believe. That's the old peg seven, where it's just running into deeps. I'd got... Uh, Obbo, Keith Obson above me, and um, I ain't got a clue, <laughs> really, <laughs> I'd looked in my boat, I'd got a few pole floats, and I didn't really know what to set up now, some folks, when they, he shouted off, we fished the first half, any method, and the, this particular, the first match, when he did this, there was about 18 inches of water on, and it were a dropping river, but it was still pushing hard, they were pushing hard, and um, I was in the deeper water. Um, the four, three, well, two, three, four, five were always fancied because they were only in the still are, peg six and five, etc. Uh, the five foot deep, nice run gravel, you know. Whereas I'm on a peg where it bottoms like that, it, uh, going down my peg, it's getting deeper all the time, but um. <coughs> Fish stick float first hour and a half, only had uh, two and a half hours rather, and I probably only had a pound and a half. I had a few little roach, a few bits and bobs, gudgeon and etc. It was really difficult fishing a big stick, uh, eight number four and etc. Holding on into it, overshotted like I've explained in one of my uh, earlier events. <coughs> and then Dick Shart's change, so. I looked at my pot, I looked at these rigs and I decided this one that I'd got were about two gram, I suppose, with an olivette and a few droppers, you know, like you'd set a normal olivette type rig up, I presume you understand that, and uh, so I, I tied it, I mean look, <laughs> we were fishing with crook and things like that at this time, so put it on and in I went, and it haunted our eyes because we couldn't get a bite on stick. All of a sudden, first run down, gets a great big roach, and uh, still lose feed, just lose feeding maggots, and perhaps probably some hemp as well, I would think, by now, that's general way. It was too coloured for caster. But it's on a dropping river, so it probably dropped two or three inches while we were fishing. But in I went again, and I remember, I ended up with 512 or something, but I lost a great big chub, um, which took me right out, and... I weren't sure what elastic, I mean, we were, this is, pole fishing was in its absolute infancy at this time. I wasn't really sure what elastic to put in, and uh, I'm thinking, chum, do I put some heavier stuff in? Whereas, and I put number eight in. Now, on the day, when I looked this chub and it went out into flow, it were a bit heavy. And after I'd had it on a bit, it didn't break me, like it just come off. Because the elastic were a bit too powerful to be honest, but it cost me. I could have, I would have won a section. But anyway, I had five pound, and that did open his eyes uh, into pole fishing. You know, we didn't. It made us realise that on the um, 
pole, it can be really, because the present, presentation like we all know nowadays, is far better than a, a running line. Those perhaps watching who don't understand, look, you, the wind is always the enemy. And you're always trying to combat the weather. Um, and uh, as I've just been explaining, the water on it would be a bit windy. So on a running line, as soon as your stick float goes away from your rod end, the more and more you trot down the river, the more and more line you've got, the more the wind affects your presentation on your float. Now on a pole, of course, wherever li set line you set from the pole to your float, and you move down the river with your pole float, with your pole. Um, now, nah, once Dick had got this going, um, we did realise, and look, from that first match, when I went from something nothing up to, a, and I mean, look, they're only a big five pound, but that was a, in the last two hours, that, it, it was just, it opened my eyes, you know what I mean, Christ, I caught nothing on the other. We were all going, oh, I've got to go on this bloody pole, and at the end of the day, it just opened the door, as soon as we had done it, we started to catch. Anyway, going back to where we were, back to the match. Sorry, <laughs> get carried away. <laughs> so, um, before the match, we're in digs, of course, we've uh, got there and uh, I thought, right, tomorrow, I'm fed up with Dick. I mean, I like Dick, don't get me wrong, um, but he was always bloody late and I'm never ready. I'm going to set my stick float up in a waggler and shove it in back of car, just break my rod apart. So at least I've got them two done. Right, and then I've only got to set my bomb, bomb up if I want to, or whatever, feeder, or whatever I'm going to do. So, uh, I'm busy setting these up, loads of car line, I looked at me watching, I thought, flipping hell, it's ten past nine. It, I'm going to be bloody late. So, well, I am late, <laughs> it's already gone, but we're only stopping just across the road, over the bridge of the first house, there on the corner, near the traffic lights, is where we used to stop. So anyway, it comes out from because there's some traffic light and of course they're all going up to get into Crown Meadow. So by the time I've done, I've got into Crown Meadow, it's well easily quarter past, it might be nearly twenty past, so I'm as bad as Dick. <laughs> but anyway, I walked on and I thought there'll be a queue light, you know, runs down bank. Nobody there. <laughs> I thought, oh God, what's going off? They've all gone. Gets to gets to the table, it's Dick there, sat there. And I, just before I got to the table, I heard, well, there's an angler missing somewhere. We've got one more peg left. I thought, oh, Christ. <laughs> Here's me trying to be quick. And I, I've ended up bloody last as usual. So uh, anyway, I gets to the bench and uh, Dick looks at me and he went, oh, might have guessed. <laughs> and all these lads who know me well, they'll know what I was. I always last. <laughs> so anyway, he, I says, oh. Blimey, me golden arms, not, I used to call me golden arm in my young days. I used to draw some good ones. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, he says, there's one left. I in a goes, think it, think it worse, some crap that bonk two, peg two on the boards. Shut up, Steve Ford. I know. <laughs> yeah, I can see you, Zim, yeah. But anyway, we're in the early days, Steve. We didn't know much about pole fishing. But this is three or four years on, so we are now into pole. You know, we're a lot better than we were them first couple of years. But it's still in its infancy. And Steve's uh, heard this story but before, but um, please bear with me if, if you've heard it before. But it's a good story, this one. And uh, so I goes on to the boards. Now, fortunately, the week before, I'd uh, had a walk down, I'd fished a qualifier, and I had a walk down the stretch after match. Now, the boards... Uh, which if you anyone doesn't understand the boards the the peg one used to be below the fence at the top end of the crown meadow now when the final was on they used to put another two i think it was or three pegs below the boards just above the fence and then there'd be three or four on the boards now these pegs were never fished of course in the qualifiers and uh, we are moving into the pleasure angler uh, opposite the opposite bank and moving up towards the bridge. We're not near the bridge, but we're moving that way. And uh, there's always been a lot of fish up there because there was all lily pads in front of the boards and these went out, oh, 14 metres, some of them, uh, some perhaps even further. And what they used to do is in the week before the actual final, they'd get a weed cutter on and cut these cam docks off so you could fish. But the problem was then you couldn't see where they were because of course they didn't cut them right down to the riverbed but they took the heads off right and um, 
So I sit down on my peg, I'd say I'm on peg two, which I really fancied. I mean, they were all, being on the boards gives you, you way more chance of coining. Um, not always, of course, you never know we're river fishing, we're any fishing. <laughs> but we're happy with the draw. And uh, so, we, as I say, sorry, I'm losing track, but week before I'd walked up and seen, you know, and I'm logging it in my head where these lily pads and but there was a real bank of weeds at about nine meters nine to sort of eleven depending where you were and as they went down river from one they widened out till you got to the end of the boards so they'd have to fish a bit further out or was it other way around it might have been other way around it might have been wider at one and narrowing off to the end of the boards to be fair might have been that whichever way it was there was a big band and uh, I thought, trotting down your peg's going to be a nightmare. Because uh, if you go halfway, th two thirds down your peg's, when you hook anything, pff, it's going to be straight in these weeds every time. Any quality fish. But um, anyway, I sat down knowing, at least I knew that there was, you know, some weed beds in this. Anyway, I set my wag with my stick up. Um, and a feed, because there was some barbel. There were an odd barbel. There weren't many at this time, to be fair, but odd person had hooked a big fish so I did set probably set a feed up but um, then I got my pole and uh, everybody's putting a great long pole you know 16 meters because it weeds so I went out there of course and set a rig up and then got another rig and, that, and then I tried to find somewhere clear around the because look fish like weeds they are they hide don't they I mean they like to be around weeds they feel safe so um, I tried to find a, a run through around these, and I did find that I'd got a run of about six metres where I could trot down and then my float would pull under like. And uh, it was in front of me, just from about a metre above me to about six metres, you know, five metres, six metres down my peg. And then it would pull under. And I thought, right, I'm going to feed that. All right, so the whistle goes and we, uh, what pole? I was on the HHP Daiwa, the one that had got like a spiral on. Uh, at that time, which was a good pole at that time, a long time ago. <laughs> um, but uh, and I think I'd, you know, I'd have eight elastic because the chub were the chub were uh, uh, always around at them days. This was, uh, although I'm sorry, I'm forgetting to tell you, at this time, this is just as the rivers were all changing. Eversham had been very poor the two previous years, and um, I hope to explain that. Um, well, I am doing. <laughs> the uh, the river was now not what it Eversham was when I first, you know, during that first ten years, uh, for six of them, as I said to you, you sit down, your first few pouchfuls of mate, the fish had erupted. It was solid with fish, but the river had got started. It was when the river, uh, when the change of the uh, river authorities had come, and the, instead of the colour in the water, it had start going clearer and clearer. And if the sun come out, you know, it were a really hard match. And the previous year, I think only eight pound had won it. it I mean, I ain't got any figures, but uh, I know it, we were all expecting a tough match. And uh, and so it proved. And when I say tough, I mean tough. And I'll explain that when we come to weigh it. But anyway, the match starts. So I starts on the uh, waggler. Starts feeding and... I has a roach and manages to, even bloody roach were stuck in these weeds. So I forget a chubby and I'm in trouble like that. I up, up one, perhaps 12, and I managed to bully it. I got it out. I did manage to skim it off at the top near it. Um, but I did manage to get it over this bank. And then he up to proper it. Vroom, it's in, in weeds. I mean, there was some chubby. We're in an area, we're in a good bit at river. So we expected to catch a few fish just here. I'd got Mal Talbot. I know I'd got Mal Talbot. If you remember Mal, he used to go on all Eversham matches. I haven't seen him for a long time. I hear he's fishing commercial somewhere, but I ain't seen Mal for a long time now. But a good angler Mal was. But he were on peg three, obviously. And uh, But anyway, this chub, and there weren't many bites anyway. And I've been feeding this short line on these weeds, and I thought I'm going to try a pole. Now... Quickly, the other lads were on pole because they realised the same. You, you hadn't got much chance on running line. The fish were always going to go in weeds. Um, and my, they, both sides, one, he's going, to be fair, he's, I think that's why I thought it, Pratt and Prop's got that wrong. I think it was wider on one, and he's fishing 16 metres. Mal's fishing right out. 
But I thought I'm going to try, you know, I really fancy this short ride amongst the weeds and we'll see what happens. So in we go, like, you know, we, we trots down and second run in, what's a nice fish. And uh, oh, bloody stuck. He's gone into weed, they below me. So I thought, oh, bloody hell. Next time, anyway, I'm pulling and uh, I couldn't get it, come off. Ugh, frustration. So, double maggot again. In again, I go. And, uh, and I'm fishing, just so uh, I ought to tell you, it's only a 0.3 float because it's not ever so deep. It's only point, what, four, five, four, five foot at the most. Uh, it's only nice and steady because I'm not fishing far out and amongst the weeds, so he's into a big toe on it. Um, and I've got a, a 20, uh, similar to a 20 whisker bob, it ratchetly in a Shima hook where I use C50, which I used to love. And I've still got loads, fortunately, because <laughs> uh, I used to sell a Shima. And the Shima's hooks were really good. And, uh, but it's a very similar to a whisker bob, but a little bit wider in the gate. Um, but anyway, double knife again. Down we go and another few runs through and, clunk, and I pulled it up and I managed to get a perch, a nice perch, eight ounce plus. So um, I thought, oh, that's all right, you know, in again, in again. And it goes downstream now, oh, it's in the friggin' weeds. I thought next time it's not going down there, mate, it's going up there. So uh, in I goes again and straight away, woof, clunk, and I pulled it like, and I pulled it straight into. <laughs> into another snag to be left. I thought, oh, for God's sake. So, I'm getting frustrated like, so uh, anyway, I goes in again. This one, I hooked. I am not kidding, it run through this weed bed and it was fine weed. It was coming up, just like a weed cutter. <laughs> Heaps of weeds coming up and all crabs. I could hear them going, goodness mate, look at that lot. And, uh, it runs out and I'm pushing sections and it runs into a wee bit out. I thought, God almighty, I can't find any way to pull them in. And uh, as I say, look, you must, look, we've been fishing poles now for 20, 30 years. We hadn't at that time, we were only fishing for them for three or four years. And uh, so we were still, to some extent, you know, uh, new to the game. Anyway, I'm cussing and swearing and... So I goes in again and runs it down and clunk, I gets another nice perch and I managed to bullet it onto the top. So I managed to get that one. Right, and, and then I went in and I got another one doing the same thing. So I thought, oh, that's better, that's better. And then I hooked a proper chub. And I'm trying to pull it that way, then I'm trying to pull it that way. And anyway, I managed to bully it onto the top, like, you know, and I'm bringing my pole back, like, you know, it up in tight line. And then, of course, my pole's up here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and I've got to take my top section off. So, uh, you know, I said, and so I've got to.